Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. And this morning I'm looking at a book which has come to us from Oxford University Press. It's called Minority Shareholders. It's now in a sixth edition. It's the law, practice and procedure involving these minority rights that the uh, minority shareholders have. Now, anybody who's suffered, uh, studied and suffered actually company law, I loved it myself, corporate governance, whatever you want to call it, I call it company law, um, basically will understand the problems regarding the, the position of the minority shareholder. This book, I think, sets the scene brilliantly in uh, explaining uh, where we are with this particular uh, area. And of course, if you are an undergraduate looking to uh, achieve a very high uh, classification, you need to refer to this book and at least read it and know it's available. It's an important book. Now, the book, as I say, uh, been written by a lot of people, actually. Uh, Victor Joffe, Queen's Counsel, David Drake, Giles Richardson, Daniel Lightman, Queen's Counsel, and Timothy Collingwood. Now, Elizabeth was the lead writer on this uh, review, and she gave it the title, A Definitive Guide to an Area of Law in which, quote, procedural change just never stops. Now, in a new edition, it's the sixth edition. Let's have a look at the book, first of all. It's a hardback from OUP. There we go. You can see the front, and then you can see the spine. There's nothing on the back. But you can see the spine. Just going to the back of the book, it's... Um, you can see the index at the back is by paragraph numbering. And it runs to 650-odd pages. It's a detailed index, very much the standard index for OUP publications. You should be able to find things pretty easily. There's an appendix with forms and precedents at the back, and, if, and it's very useful for pleading purposes. Then you've got at the front, there is the actual front page itself. Um, and then we've got after that... Uh, a dedication. I always like to show the dedications. Uh, I only review books, Elizabeth, I only review books which are, in our view, good books. We don't review bad books because we don't upset uh, people who are actually have written the work and uh, it, it gets a bad review. Now, Lord Briggs of Westbourne from the, has actually, uh, Judicial Studies College, has written a foreword which is well worth reading. And then you've got a preface from the authors. Uh, just setting out where we are. Then you've got a list. In the content section, by chapter, you've got a list of what is actually um, set out and, and who has written the various chapters. They're very helpful running all the way through. Uh, nine chapters in total. Then you've got, of course, appendix, which are forms and precedents. You've got the excellent and then an index. Then you've got the excellent case law. There's a lot of case law in company law. I've always loved company law because the cases are so fascinating. Then after the cases, you've got legislation. Um, and guess what? The Companies Act, of course. Then, of course, after that, you've got a quite useful... There are some international treaties and regulations linked in at the back. Then you've got some small list of abbreviations. And then you get into the in introduction itself. There's a very small index, could have been a bit bigger possibly, I don't know, but there's a little index to begin with just to explain what's what. You've got the paragraph numbering down the sides there, and then you've got footnoting. You can probably see the footnoting there, and just opening it up in the middle, you can see it runs through. There are subheadings as well, looking at procedure and so forth. <clears throat> and then cases where the remedy is available, so when you've been badly treated, and so forth. Very good book. I'm very impressed with it. I have actually seen this book before, and I think I reviewed... Um, an edition some years ago, probably about 10 years ago now. Um, but, as I say, this subject matter always crops up because you do get one or two shareholders. Not exactly the largest amount of money they've put into a company, but they, they have a right to be heard. And, unfortunately, sometimes they don't get that right heard. And, of course, there are, there are things that can be done depending on what happens. So what do we say about the book? Well, quote, This new standard practitioner's textbook is more than living up to its well-deserved reputation for wisdom and thoroughness, writes Lord Briggs of Westbourne, in the forward to what is a brand new edition of Minority Shareholders published by OUP. 
it's the sixth edition of a definitive work and an ample testament to its reliability and authority over the years. And as Briggs also remarks, it continues to be invaluable for judges, advisers, litigators, and indeed any practitioners finding themselves embroiled in the complexities of this ever-evolving area of law. And as I say, it's got a much wider application than just merely for uh, the lawyers. I think students will find this helpful too, at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Significantly, the book commences with an exposition of director's duties, and there are many of them, to list too many, of course, to list here. But to mention a few, they include primarily the duty to promote the success of the company, to exercise independent judgment and avoid conflicts of interest. And directors' duties, as the authors explain, and a lot of them, of course, the authors and the duties, are of particular relevance to the minority shareholder who may be directly affected by any breach. What follows from here, of course, under the heading of derivative claims, is a discussion of the distinction between the personal rights of the shareholder and the rights of the company, a fundamental principle as the rights of minority shareholders are vulnerable to abuse. And the protection of said rights, of course, is one of the key concepts that informs this book, which since the previous edition of 2015 has undergone a few changes. For example, the former chapter 6 has been expanded into two new chapters. That's to take account of changes. And the first covers substantive law. The second, a new chapter 7, now looks at such matters, uh, matters as remedies and valuation pertaining to unfair prejudice petitions. Additionally, the book's international focus has received increased emphasis, as evidenced in a revised Chapter 9, together with references throughout to decisions in common law courts around the world. Um, even though, as pointed out by Briggs, there has been no, quote, earth-shaking change to primary legislation calling for a new edition. So this is a part of the law in which judicial decisions are constantly refining the principles and procedural change just never stops. And of course that's bound to be the case with the way that the procedurals go and of course the way in which um, the case law develops. We do have a very large number of cited authorities these days and of course they are very valuable as, as the bedrock of the common law. Now this then is a lucid, comprehensive, current and analytical guide to a notoriously labyrinthine topic. That's what we say anyway. When charged with providing advice to a broad range of financial service clients, practitioners, we think, will find it of immense help. We certainly did. I found it a very interesting book. It's easy to read as well. That's another thing that helps. So let me conclude. Those seeking further information will find an abundance of research resources from the specifically detailed footnoting to the extensive tables of cases and legislation and almost 50 pages of forms and precedents which are at the back, uh, 22 of them provided in the appendix. And in short then, no practitioner library in our view should be without this definitive work of reference, especially if you're involved in corporate matters with this complete and comprehensive coverage of a key area of law. The date of publication is cited as at the 20th of December 2018, and I don't know exactly when the, the law is as stated at, but it would have been the middle part of 2018. But there are a lot of changes, of course, taking place. Let's look at the book one last time. There's the front, and then there's the side. Just opening it in the middle, I'm here. When may contributors petition? And there, that gives you an idea of when you've got a problem and it gives you the basic points about what you can and can't do. You see the paragraph numbering and you can see the footnoting uh, throughout. And of course it does go very much towards um, the legislation as well. In this case it's the Insolvency Act and you see it runs on like that. Let's say right at the back you do have the very useful the appeals of course always at the back. Always useful to bear in mind appeals. I, I did find that people do like to appeal more regularly than they used to. And then you've got the appendices right at the back there, which I didn't show earlier, but you can see them. There's quite a lot of them. Twelve, uh, 22 particular um, points, heads of point there, the points of note rather there. There's the book anyway. A very big thank you to all the authors for what has been a studious effort. Um, very, very helpful. This is where, where the law is found. You make our lives a lot easier, OUP. Thank you for doing this because this is where the law is. 
and it does help us when we're trying to advise or adjudicate. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.